All right, hello and welcome everyone. Um, as you may know, April is not only Arab Heritage Month, but also Autism and Neurodiversity Awareness Month. And so to celebrate, we are thrilled, thrilled to kick off our first ever DEI speaker series with a discussion of neurodiversity with our guest, Steve Silverman, and our very own Bartley Tablante. So just as a quick introduction and definition for anyone who might not be aware, neurodiversity is a portmanteau of neurological and diversity used to refer to genetic variation in the human brain regarding social behavior, learning, attention, mood, and other mental functions in a non-pathological sense. It can be contrasted with the medical model, which views conditions like autism or ADHD more as disorders to prevent, treat, or cure. The term neurodivergent originally referred most commonly to autism, but has since come to include many things like ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette's, synesthesia and OCD, even anxiety and depression, as well as other learning and developmental differences. So to introduce our guest, Steve Silverman is an award-winning science writer whose articles have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Nature, and many other publications. He's the author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity, published by Avery in 2015, which Oliver Sacks called a sweeping and penetrating history presented with a rare sympathy and sensitivity. Side note, Keystone is offering to purchase a copy for anyone who wants one, so be sure to sign up for that. And to convince you a little bit more, the book became a widely praised bestseller in the United States and the United Kingdom, won the 2015 Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction, and was chosen as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, The Economist, The Financial Times, The Boston Globe, The Independent, and many other publications. And it has been translated into more than 20 languages. In 2016, Silberman gave the keynote speech at the United Nations for World Autism Awareness Day, and he has given talks on the history of autism at Yale, MIT, National Academy of Sciences, Apple, Google, and many other major institutions. His TED Talk, The Forgotten History of Autism, has been viewed nearly 2 million times at many different languages. He lives with his husband, Keith, in San Francisco. So Steve's accomplishments are clearly vast, and we really are honored that he is coming to speak with us. Thank you so much, Monty. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And hey, Bartley, thank you uh, so much for uh, being a uh, part of this conversation and allowing me to have a conversation with you about this important subject. My pleasure. Um, <clears throat> and I can, I, I would love to kick things off. And uh, first, I uh, really enjoyed reading Neurotribes and would recommend it to, to those that haven't and, and get your order from, from Rachel. Um, it was great to hear and read about the history of, of uh, the treatment and perspectives on, on autism and how that community uh, and those perspectives have evolved over, over the years. For those that haven't read Neurotribes, I'm wondering if you could give a brief overview on the book and what to expect and... Sure. Um, well, for one thing, even though it's a frighteningly long looking book, uh, I tried to make it very exciting and uh, I almost tried to write it as a kind of mystery story in a way. Um, and it reflects my own personal journey uh, from what Bonnie just aptly called the medical model uh, to what we would now call the neurodiversity paradigm. And uh, let me just explain how that happened. Um, back in the year 2000, uh, I was on a boat in Alaska with a, a bunch of computer programmers uh, on something called a geek cruise. And the star of the cruise was this guy named Larry Wall who invented a programming language called Perl, um, which was uh, very, very widely used in, uh, in Amazon, Microsoft Software, the IMDB. Um, and so I noticed that a lot of people on this cruise in Alaska were A, brilliant, B, uh, took an almost, um, you know, almost a teenage enthusiasm about their work uh, but many of them were kind of socially awkward. Uh, and I'm sure if you work in technology, you've met people like this. Um, we all have. I was a, a science writer for Wired for uh, many years and met many people like that. Um, and so as we were coming back into port, I asked Larry if I could interview him at home. And he said, yeah, sure. I should probably tell you, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And at that point, two, and this was just 2000, so 20 years ago, autism was mistakenly considered very, very rare. Um, and in fact, teachers who uh, had an autistic kid in their class were told like, oh, you should really pay attention to this because it's probably the only kid like that you'll ever have. Um, well, uh, a 
couple months later, I was writing about another technologically very adept family in Silicon Valley, asked them if I could interview them at home. And they said, oh, yeah, sure. By the way, we have a profoundly autistic daughter. And I thought, oh, that's odd. Like, I thought autism was rare. You know, why is this coming up twice? And as I was telling that exact story to a friend of mine in a cafe in San Francisco, a woman at the next table suddenly screamed, really. She said, oh, my God. Do you realize what's going on? And I said, what's going on? And she said, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. And so because I was a science writer, um, I thought, wow, that, you know, that sounds really heavy. So I went to look at it and it did not seem to me that what was happening after a bunch of research was that, you know, there was something in the water supply of Silicon Valley or too much screen time or anything like that or vaccines, which people were already talking about, um, it seemed to me that it was genetics. And that what was happening was that certain genes that could actually convey advantages in the tech space uh, in uh, working with algorithms and uh, working with sort of taxonomies of information could actually be an advantage. And that those same genes, particularly if they were sort of concentrated uh, if two parents had the same genes, that they could produce an autistic child. And at that point, that was a very radical suggestion. Um, it no longer is because it seems to be true. And um, for instance, when I uh, spoke at Google, um, there were a lot of parents there and many of them had autistic traits as well as autistic kids. And um, so I started to think about why did the numbers of diagnoses start going up so steeply in the 90s, which they inarguably did? If you looked at all these graphs that were all over uh, the internet at the time, these kind of scaremongering graphs, they would always show this kind of you know, hockey stick uh, acceleration of diagnoses in the 90s. And at the same time, I started getting emails. Uh, I wrote an article about that cruise, which I thought would just vanish off the face of the earth because I filed it the same month that 9-11 happened, right? So I figured nobody would ever see that article. Instead, I got email about that article for like 10 years. Um, and most of the emails were about people's difficulty in accessing basic services, uh, getting jobs, getting healthcare, um, getting support from uh, uh, teachers in education, transition programs from high school to college to the workplace. And, and so there were all these like really basic human concerns that were not being met. Meanwhile, the whole world was becoming obsessed with autism, but it was becoming obsessed with do vaccines cause autism? And so I thought, why is this one question sort of crowding out all these other issues that the families are writing me about. So I started to do the research. I figured out that the basic timeline of autism's discovery as it was reiterated in thousands of textbooks and Wikipedia was incorrect. And that if you understood the correct timeline of autism's discovery, that you would understand why those numbers went up so steeply in the 90s and why in fact that was not a disaster but in fact, a very good thing, because it meant that uh, people and their families that really needed help were able to access it. So that's how I got interested in neurodiversity from going from the medical model myself back in 2000. Oh, my God, there's an epidemic of autism, you know, to understanding that what I was really writing about was a uh, the birth of a new kind of civil rights movement. And that's why. Uh, diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives are becoming interested in neurodiversity because that's what it really is. It's a group of people or a neuro tribe, as I call them in my book, um, who have been here forever making, con uh, making contributions to our society in science, art, music, etc., often while being bullied or excluded from mainstream neurotypical society. Um, and that instead of an epidemic of autism, what we were having was an epidemic of recognition that autistic people exist. And so I went from writing a story about an epidemic to write a, writing a story of the birth of a new kind of civil rights movement. 
And, and as an economist, I, I love a good story of, of uncovering reverse co correlation and, yeah. and, and figuring out the, the, the real underlying uh, structural framework. Yeah. There, there's a couple of themes you, you touched on, on, on how it's no longer what I would view as a, a scary or terrifying diagnosis for a parent, how there's more support services that are, that are becoming available. I would love to hear more about where the space is going um, and, and what we can expect on the horizon for support or, or, or the changing societal perspective towards autism or, or other neurodiversity. Well, one thing that I discovered, there are several things that I discovered in the course of uh, researching neurotribes are relevant to that question. One of them is that um, autism in particular used to be regarded by pediatricians, uh, uh, clinicians, psychologists, psychiatrists, as quote unquote, a fate worse than death. I, heur I heard that phrase hundreds of times from parents who were told that about their children. And in fact, one of the, um, one of the children who in a sense inspired the writing of Neurotribes, um, when she was born, her, uh, she was diagnosed almost immediately and uh, her pediatrician told her family um, there is very little difference between your daughter and an animal. She just, by the way, got her master's degree in special education. So, um, you know, I started to see that, wow, these predictions were really dire, you know, particularly like back in the 1990s. Why is that? And what I discovered was that the reason why that was, was that basically what happened to autistic people before the 1990s or so was that they were um, separated into two groups. One group, they wouldn't even get a diagnosis of autism. They were just thought of as weird, like the uncle in the attic who, you know, talked about World War II battles all the time or whatever, you know, or the daughter who really watches Doctor Who very intensely, you know. Um, so those people wouldn't even be counted, you know, as autistic people. People who were who had more challenges than that, like for instance, autistic people who could not speak, use written language, they would get put in mental institutions for often for adults. Uh, and they were subjected to um, all manner of horrific uh, quote unquote therapies from electric shock to uh, it, at Bellevue, which is like the most famous psychiatric hospital in the United States, uh, the head of psychiatry there gave a group of autistic kids LSD every day for uh, three months until she discovered that it was making them more anxious. Well, if I took LSD every day for three months, I would be very anxious myself. So what was happening was these kids were not getting any education. They were not getting any coaching on you know, jobs at all. Um, so in a sense, it was a, it was a fate worse than death but the fate that was worse than death was the institutionalization, not the condition. Um, and uh, so I noticed that parents who resisted uh, the standard practice of putting the kid in an institution, and they were literally told to remove their pictures from the family albums and move on with their lives, you know? Parents who resisted that and kept their kids at home and offered them educational opportunities if they could find them, um, that their kids often exceeded the dire predictions that were set for them. And in fact, um, a couple of the guys who went on to inspire the character of, uh, who was the central character in Rain Man, played by Dustin Hoffman, um, they were kids who were not institutionalized by their parents and were given a chance to succeed. And in fact, one of them um, worked in the uh, Princeton University Library for many years, he may still. Um, so I noticed that basically all of those dire predictions were based on a, uh, a method of treatment, or you could say simply hiding these people from society that was um, terrible, you know? And so I started to think that what we needed to do was to make social changes that would benefit uh, autistic people and their families. And so you asked about the future and I wanna talk now about some really positive things that have happened because um, 
we've all had a very difficult last couple of years. Um, you know, actually the last several years, even before COVID, have been, have been difficult for many of us. And um, so there's been a lot of bad news. But at the same time, there's been a lot of good news from the neurodiversity space. And I'll give you some examples. The best films that have ever been made about autism have come out in the last couple of years. And you can see them, and I'll tell you what they are. There is a Pixar short called Loop, which is about a, uh, a young uh, Black woman with autism. She was played by a, an autistic actress. Um, just depicting a young Black woman with autism was a huge step forward because um, uh, Black people and other people of color are consistently underdiagnosed um, with autism. Also, women are consistently underdiagnosed. Um, and it's, it's a very honest film. It does not whitewash autism. It is, you know, some people uh, will say, well, the problem with neurodiversity is that, you know, you just see these like brilliant geeks, like, uh, uh, you know, on the Big Bang Theory, et cetera. But actually, Loop is very, very honest about a non-speaking autistic person and the challenges that she faces, wonderful film. There's another film, it's a little harder to find, but it's called This Is Not About Me. You can Google it and search for it. It's the story of a young woman named Jordan Zimmerman, who when she was a kid, she was completely written off by her teachers as having no potential whatsoever. Her parents were told that she would live the rest of her life in an institution because she didn't speak, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she was also very self-injurious. Um, and so she, it was predicted that nothing would ever become of her. Well, her parents made sure, and, her, and a couple of her more progressive teachers made sure that she got technology, an iPad, that enabled her to communicate without having to speak. And once she could uh, basically make her wish, not just her wishes and her desires and her preferences known, but once she could make her inner world known to the adults around her, it was recognized that in fact, she had tremendous potential. She just graduated with a master's degree in special education. And um, so th that's a wonderful film. Another wonderful film is um, The Reason I Jump based on a, a Japanese bestseller uh, or rather a bestseller written by a Japanese teenager. Um, the movie however, is much more expansive of you than the book, which was mostly about that kid because it was like his diary. Uh, the movie is about the fate of autistic people in many different cultures worldwide. Um, cultures like America, but also cultures where autistic people are considered possessed by the devil, etc. And so it's a really uh, intense and very beautiful and ultimately very uplifting view of autism through a cross-cultural lens, the reason I jump. So that's another great film. Uh, in the strictly hilarious and wonderful um, department, there's Hannah Gadsby's Douglas. Hannah Gadsby is a, is a, is a comedian from New Zealand. Um, she just wrote a book, which I am going to read, uh, which I'm forgetting the title of, I'm sorry. But uh, Hannah Gadsby, Google her. Um, and uh, her movie, Douglas, she was autistic, didn't know it until she was, um, you know, later on in her life. Uh, and it really helped her understand why she had been socially awkward her whole life. And I once asked an autistic woman who was diagnosed in midlife what it was like to find out that she was autistic uh, in midlife. And she said, getting a diagnosis was like finding a Rosetta Stone to myself. Um, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time. And that's true of not just autism, but you know, people with ADHD or hopefully anxiety disorder, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, you find, because the, the thing about diagnosis, which doesn't have to come through official channels, um, that's a big controversial question. Some people can't afford it. In some uh, places on earth, an official diagnosis is really hard to, to get, but you not only get a diagnosis, you get a community if uh, you are able to relate to your peers. Somebody recently asked me, like, should I pursue a diagnosis? And I said, well, 
one thing I would do is if you can find uh, autistic adults hang out with, even online in a sense, uh, which is very possible to do because there are many online communities for autistic people, um, you know, within the communities for everyone. Um, there's a huge uh, autistic community on Twitter, which uses the hashtag actually autistic. Um, if you hang out with those people, do you feel that they're your people? Like in a way that that's a, you know, it's a, that's a good basic guideline. A an official diagnosis can be helpful because that's the gatekeeper to services. But if you think you don't need a heavy duty amount of services and just want to know, well, am I autistic? Um, uh, hang out with autistic people and seeing if you feel like them, basically, if they feel like your people, uh, that can help. Um, another positive sign is that autistic, uh, po openly autistic politicians uh, like a woman named Jessica Benin uh, are running for office and winning, uh, which is great. Um, a huge positive thing that's happening that is gonna have um, good implications for the future is that when I started writing Neurotribes, um, if, there were of course many, many stories about autism because it was the, you know, kind of a, during the height of the vaccine, uh, his, well, actually now is the height of the vaccine hysteria, but um, uh, <laughs> which was something I did not foresee, uh, I must say, and is most unfortunate. But um, there would be a million articles about autism without any quotes from autistic people. So it was like story after story about, you know, is feminism valid, you know, with only quotes from men, you know, well, I think feminism, you know, <laughs> etc. And so I started to think, wait, like, shouldn't the reporter like call autistic, you know, so I would, I would, what I would do is, uh, particularly once my book came out and became a bestseller, when uh, news people would call me, um, I would say, have you talked to autistic adults? And it was always like, like, <laughs> I was like, oh, you can do that? <laughs> like, uh, you know, so I would give them, I would say like, call these people, you know? And so um, autistic people started to get quoted in uh, news coverage. Now you have people like uh, the reporter, Eric uh, Michael Garcia, who uh, just wrote a, bo a wonderful book called We're Not Broken. He's an autistic reporter for The Independent. And he's also written for the Washington Post and many other major outlets. Uh, and We're Not Broken is a history of uh, autism, uh, history and future of autism from an autistic perspective, which I could only dream about when that was happening. And uh, by pure coincidence, later today at 3 p.m., uh, I think it's 3 p.m. Pacific, maybe 6, I'll have to check. Um, it's in my Twitter feed somewhere which is, by the way, at Steve Silverman. Please follow me if you're interested in this stuff. Um, there's going to be a panel of autistic journalists at the Columbia Journalism School. So this is a major advancement. Um, and one of the reasons why I became interested in neurodiversity is because when I was a kid in high school, what I was was defined by the psychiatric establishment as mentally ill, which was, I would get crushes on my male friends. <laughs> and um, even though, you know, uh, lots of people get crushes on their friends when they're in high school, um, for me, that could have meant being put in a mental institution or being arrested if I was caught, you know, kissing one of my male friends, which wouldn't have happened anyway. Instead, I was being bullied all the time. Um, and so it wasn't until the early 70s, which is when I was in high school, that the, the DSM, which is like the Bible of psychiatry, that it's so-called delisted homosexuality as a mental illness. And what made that happen was not a bunch of psychiatrists discovering, oh my God, homosexuality isn't a mental illness after all. That's not what happened. What happened was a bunch of psychiatrists were like, hey, wait a minute, I'm gay too. Maybe I'm not mentally ill. And when people say to me, well, you know, neurodiversity, oh my God, it's so depressing how long it's taking for, you know, autistic people to be accepted, et cetera. All I can say is, look at this kids, this is a wedding ring. 
Um, that is a tremendous amount of social change in one lifetime. I am very happily married to an absolutely wonderful, very geeky science teacher <laughs> named Keith. Um, and uh, that, you know, believe me, if I'd known that that would happen when I was in high school, and I'll, I'll just be, I'll be very blunt here. If I'd known that that would happen when I was in high school, I wouldn't have been so suicidal. I was suicidal because I was getting bullied all the time and being told by society that I was sick. And so that amount of social change, which some people are trying to roll back now, hello, um, uh, happened in one lifetime. So I'm very, very hopeful about the future of neurodiversity. That's uh, uh, so much valuable uh, items that, 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 that came out there. I think it gets better is, is, is one of the phrases that- that's Yeah, used absolutely. That and, and one thing, one phrase that I, I appreciated from your book that, that hadn't seen before is, is, I think it's nothing about us without us. Yes, absolutely. And that's, uh, we, we often give the advice uh, on our teams and, and I think uh, Jeff alluded to it earlier, just call the experts uh, and, and include them in the conversation because we can do that. They often will enjoy, the, enjoy that representation. It's really nice to hear about um, not only the, the, the representation that's now available in entertainment, uh, politics and 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 um, there's a, one one item to uh, I'd love to come back to is is as we think about the the growth and uh, understanding neurodiversity and advancements from societal and scientific perspectives, we'd love to hear if if there's uh, risk in the expansion of the definition of of neurodiversity. Well, that's interesting. For one thing, um, it's important that people understand that the word neurodiversity is not like some kind of something that a bunch of psychiatrists or academic researchers came up with. Well, it was an academic researcher, but the person who came up with neurodiver the term neurodiversity, um, which is a story that I tell in Neurotribes, was uh, an Australian uh, graduate student named Judy Singer. And she um, uh, had a daughter who was autistic but did not fit the very narrow definition of autism at the time. For instance, autistic kids were said to have no interest in even knowing their parents and you know, their parents would walk into a room and turn, turn away, et cetera. Well, her daughter wasn't like that. Um, I, I've had lunch at a New York deli with Judy, her, her wonderful daughter, and her daughter is absolutely adorable and very loving and very sweet, but she is autistic. And so um, Judy started to think all the words that I have to describe, uh, and Judy, by the way, felt that she had autistic traits. She also felt that her mother was probably an undiagnosed autistic woman. And that had been sort of stigmatized even within her own family for many years because her mother was a Holocaust survivor. So whenever anybody asked, like, why is Judy's mother like so weird? Oh, she's a Holocaust survivor. Don't talk about it. You know, so in a way, like Judy's mother was rendered invisible in her own family, in a sense. Um, and Judy started to think all the uh, words that I have to describe my mother, my daughter, and myself are, are negative words. There are like deficits and impairments and, uh, you know, lack of various skills. And so she started to think, what if I came up with a word? that framed the condition of these people in my family, these people I love as positive. And one of the big influences on her was one of her mentors who had survived polio and was in a wheelchair. And so he hipped her to, to what's now called the social model of disability. And the social model of disability uh, as Bonnie Nortz uh, said in chat, I'm seeing, um, is that it's society that actually determines how disabled you are. And if that seems like a, a difficult concept to grasp, I'll give you very clear examples. Let's say you live in a wheelchair, like Judy's mentor who had polio. Um, if you live in a town that has no accessible bathrooms, no accessible classrooms, stairs everywhere, no ramps, no curb cuts as they're called in England, you are super disabled. But if you live in a community like Berkeley, which was the center of the independent living movement 
uh, for disabled people, and we're talking about people with physical disabilities at the time, there are ramps, they're accessible. I'm not saying it's a dream, but you know, you can get around. You're barely disabled, you know. So the social model of disability is one of the biggest mind flips that I would recommend for everyone because it locates the source of disability in a failure of society to meet your needs. And to make this very personal, and I don't usually talk about this actually, um, my mother has developed dementia in the last uh, couple of years. And uh, it, you know it's unbelievably rough, mainly on her, but also for me and my sister. And uh, because I've been thinking about neurodiversity, instead of thinking about, oh my God, you know, why can't my mother remember anything? Why can't she dial a phone? You know, I think, okay, what can we do? What little changes can we make in her environment so that she can actually do what she wants to do as much as possible? I mean, we're not gonna be able to cure her dementia, you know, but, but we can make her life easier by giving her little things, including like, you know, just to be very concrete and specific, she couldn't, she lost her ability to use smartphones um, and, you know, choosing the screens and, you know, typing passwords, forget it. Um, I got her, uh, I went through five phones, by the way, before I, I figured what to do, figured out what to do. I got her an old school landline that looks exactly like the phones that she's always had. So instead of this weird new thing with a screen that she can't figure out that rings, you know, frighteningly, she is, there it is, you know, the old phone that she used to have in the eighties. And, and now she can talk, you know, we talk several times a day and she's still my mom and she's still wonderful. Um, but it was really thinking about neurodiversity and thinking about the social model of disability that helped me help her. So in a sense, I, I put this stuff to the test, you know, in my own family with someone I deeply love and care about who's going through something very difficult. And it works. Um, once you start thinking uh, about the social model of disability, instead of thinking like, well, we have to figure out some way to make everyone walk. You know, <laughs> Let's figure out like robot suits that can make everyone walk. No, build a ramp. You know, that's what they want. They want <laughs> They just need access, you know? And one of my favorite t-shirts that I've seen in uh, the last several years, I saw it at a, at a uh, an autism related event uh, and it was being worn by the mother of a kid in uh, Neurotribes who I call the boy who loved green straws, Leo Rosa. And his mother, Shannon, was wearing a t-shirt that said, access is love. And I think that is a profoundly um, transformative statement. I, that's uh, a, a, a wonderful success story, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that that, that, that your mom can still communicate and, and, and use yeah. that, um, and and I, I think gives a, a nice lesson for 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 all of us. Um, I have a, a, a ton more questions that I, I would uh, really enjoy going through, but I want to recognize uh, the. 50 other people joining us and, and open it up a little bit to, to questions from the group. Great. I'm, Steve, uh, just from following you, you, I know that you've taken like an interesting journey in journalism in that you've had the opportunity to meet and interview many of the folks that were at one point, you know, idols for you in the music space. And I'm curious, um, if you've developed any um, either academically rigorous or completely anecdotal and unrigorous points of view about how uh, musicianship and neurodiversity might intersect at all, or if perhaps it's much more of a, um, a physical gift, like sports would be considered a physical gift, or if it's some combination, or if you don't have any. Kind of point of view. Well, that's, that's a really fascinating question that I've never been asked in hundreds of you know events and interviews. Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking me that question. It's very thought provoking. I don't have a like canned answer. So l let me think about this. And I, I would think, yes, the answer is yes. And we'll start with um, 
you know, one of the uh, people who I've gotten to know uh, very well, who I was a complete, total, raving, obsessed fanboy about from high school, was David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And um, I've done a bunch of writing for him, including, uh, I've done a bunch of stuff with David, and I now consider him a really good friend. Somebody once asked Stephen if he ever thought he had autistic traits. And well, all of his friends, including David, definitely believe that that's the case. And what Steven said was, yes, why do you think I put a guitar between myself and the world? Which I thought was a really profound statement. And we know from scientific, I mean, I've never written a scientific paper on this, but we do know from scientific um, research that uh, autistic people have um, are overrepresented in what is called perfect pitch or absolute pitch or relative pitch as well, which means many autistic people, more than neurotypicals, which is the somewhat satirical word for non-autistic people in the neurodivergence community, um, have these abilities to hear a note and identify it. Oh, that's an A sharp. You know, I mean, I'm not a musician, so I might even be saying that wrong, but um, that's what they can do. And so if you look at the career of someone like Glenn Gould, all right, Glenn Gould was the leading Bach interpreter of the 20th century. Um, his recordings of, say, the Goldberg variations, both of them, one of them made early in his career and one made later, they're unbelievable. They're the, you know, the absolute holy standard, you know, of Bach interpretations. If you look at footage on YouTube of Glenn Gould, boy, does he ever look autistic. He's rocking back and forth. Um, you know, his listeners would be like, why is Glenn Gould humming on this, you know, <laughs> recording, you know? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's called stimming within autism. I actually spoke to a waiter who uh, worked at the restaurant where Glenn Gould would eat in Toronto at the same table every night in the same chair, ordering the same thing every night when he was in Toronto. So, uh, you know, even though I tend to be very conservative about what's called retro diagnosing people, I think Glenn Gould is a slam dunk for an autistic musician. And, you know, it's not, oh, he became the leading Bach interpreter of the 20th century in spite of his autism. Um, no, he became the leading Bach interpreter of the 20th century because of his autism. Um, and so I do think that uh, there's some relation between giftedness in music and, and uh, autistic traits, which is not at all to say, oh, all autistic people have this special gift for music. They do not. And the same is true for um, working in technology. It's true, according to the research of the a uh, guy named Simon Baron Cohen, that tech-centric communities um, like Silicon Valley and certain places in Europe seem to have a very high proportion of people with autistic traits. But that does not mean that your kid who was just diagnosed is going to necessarily turn out to work at Apple or Google or, or Keystone even, you know. Um, not all autistic people have gifts not all autistic people have interests in the same areas. Not all autistic people can be pigeonholed. You know, there are some autistic people who have absolutely no interest in technology, geek culture, music, art, et cetera. Um, but there does seem to be some correlation uh, in certain fields and music is definitely one of them. Thanks for that. I think Bonnie had a question in the chat. Bonnie? Yeah, I think Sepeda had one before me, so maybe we could do that one first. Oh, what do we know about the correlation between genes contributing to high IQ and autism? Um, do you know, I haven't read a recent paper on this. One thing that, uh, that you know, I don't want to dive into speculation about this, so I want to be very careful. One thing that is very interesting is that before the 80s, I would say, 
and people like Simon Baron Cohen and uh, particularly Lorna Wing, uh, a British uh, cognitive psychiatrist who is one of the real heroes of my book, because in a sense, she basically, she and a colleague named Judith Gould basically came up with what we now call the spectrum. Um, and uh, she, she and Judith behind the scenes widened the diagnostic criteria so that more people could get a diagnosis. And so, you know, I hate to spoil my own book, but, you know, one of the reasons why the numbers started going up so steeply in the 90s was on purpose because Wing and Gould changed the criteria behind the scenes. And what's interesting is that one reason why, why hardly anyone knows that and this vaccine hysteria took off is that um, autism had been mistakenly considered very rare. So it was like Lorna was like, oh, we're just going to make these little changes and we'll publish about it in the usual journals that, you know, 20 people will read and, you know, et cetera. She had no idea that there was like an ocean of autistic people out there who desperately needed a diagnosis. And that once she opened those artificially narrow gates, that the ocean would come flooding in. And that's what happened. Um, but they started studying autistic people who did not have intellectual disability. Back in the, you know, in the 50s and 60s and 70s even, um, particularly if you were an autistic person of color, you would be diagnosed not as autistic, but mentally retarded, a, you know, a phrase that we thankfully do not use anymore. Um, and what's really interesting is that um, people like, most people don't know this, but people like Lorna and Simon started studying autistic people with high IQ because they felt that that was a more pure form of autism that was not obscured by intellectual disability. They saw people with autism and intellectual disability as having sort of a mixture of these two diagnoses. And they thought, well, if we study people with normal or high intelligence, but who are also clearly autistic, then we're studying a purer form of autism. What's, I mean, this is like really, we could talk about this for hours and it's a very niche interest. But what's really interesting is that now there's like this pushback from uh, some parents saying, oh, no, 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 those high IQ people, that's not the real autism. You know, it's our kids with intellectual disability or kids who can't speak. That's the real autism, you know. So there's an interesting sort of cycle of pushes in different directions. But, um, you know, basically autism with high or normal IQ was called Asperger syndrome by Lorna Wing because she, her husband spoke German. She was able to read this very pioneering paper by this guy, Hans Asperger, uh, who unfortunately was uh, working in Austria in the late, uh, mid to late 1930s and early 1940s when the Nazis took over. And so the medical establishment that Asperger was working for became absolutely murderous because one of the, one of the most disturbing uh, chapters in my book is about how the Nazis practiced for the Holocaust against the Jews by exterminating disabled children. Uh, and in fact, I determined that many of the kids who were exterminated were diagnosed with either epilepsy or schizophrenia. And that's what autistic kids would have been diagnosed with um, before the term, before Asperger actually, and his Jewish colleagues who had then had to leave Austria um, and I'm not going to spoil this, but um, for a long time, up until I wrote my book, actually, uh, for a long time, the fact that autism seemed to have been discovered simultaneously by two completely different clinicians, one in Austria and one in America, um, within several years of each other, it seemed like this, one of the biggest medical coincidences of the 20th century. I discovered that actually something much more interesting happened with those two clinicians. <laughs> so that's one of the big, I'm not going to reveal it, but that's one of the big sort of gets in my book was that I figured out that mystery. Um, and so uh, basically what Lorna did was because autism had become so stigmatized and was like parents were blamed for it by these BS theories of, you know, these famous psychiatrists who said that 
uh, you know, autistic parents were cold and, or the parents of autistic kids were cold and, you know, these sort of merciless yuppies who had no time for their own kids. Because of all that, Lorna found that some parents, if they had a kid with high or normal IQ and autism, they resisted the label of autism because it both stigmatized the kid and stigmatized the parents. So she came up with the term Asperger syndrome to talk about kids with high or normal IQs and autism. Um, so that, that's one of the more interesting um, dynamics in my book. Apparently there's a couple of questions in the chat. Do you want to steer Steve to those? Yeah, sure. Let me see. Uh, yeah, if time permits, could you, from Bonnie, if, if time permits, could you talk more about stimming and maybe about masking? Yeah, um, stimming is really interesting. Stimming is both one of the most instantly recognizable stereotypes of autism because it's like the kids who, you know, go like this or rock back and forth or et cetera. And um, one of the horrible uh, psychiatrists uh, who was the leading autism theorist of the 20th century, uh, Ivar Lovas, the father of applied behavioral analysis, um, he theorized that kids who stim or stimulated self-stimulation, that they could never learn anything because the act of stimming uh, would sort of block out, you know, external sources of knowledge. That turned out to be the opposite of the truth. There has actually been a tremendous amount of scientific research that stimming is a way that autistic people regulate their own anxiety. And, you know, that's not such an exotic idea. It's like, I don't know if any of you are knitters, like my husband is, but, you know, knitting is a very repetitive and soothing, um, you know, way to regulate your anxiety. I would not be surprised to hear that if any of you are knitters, you have been knitting more, like, you know, since COVID or whatever. Um, it's a way to calm yourself down and regulate your anxiety. And in fact, autistic people learn better when they're allowed to stim. So that's huge. Masking is uh, the uh, actually, hashtag actually autistic word for um, concealing your autistic traits uh, for the sake of uh, the neurotypical people around you. And it's the kind of thing that um, takes really a big toll on autistic people. Because if you ever want to be friends with an autistic person, this is what you should not say. Do not say, oh my God, I had no idea you were autistic. You seem so normal. You know, that's like telling me, it's like, I had no idea you were gay. You're not some big queen. Actually, I am some big queen. But, um, you know, it's like, uh, it, you know, if it's not a sh source of shame, then not looking that way shouldn't be a virtue, you know? So uh, masking is the psychological process of, uh, you know, not stimming, um, trying to act normal, you know, there's tremendous pressure on autistic people to act normal. Why can't you just act normal is what, you know, parents will say if they're in denial. Um, and, uh, and, you know, even friends can, you know, why do you have to be so difficult about everything? Um, and that can really be a problem. And so there's actually a book by, uh, that just came out called Unmasking Autism by uh, Devin Price that is all about uh, masking and the toll that it takes on autistic people. And uh, again, to be very blunt, that toll is serious because for autistic people with intellectual disability, the leading cause of death is epilepsy. So we should be working on drugs that work in the autistic brain for epilepsy. But for autistic people with high or normal IQs, one of the leading causes of death is suicide. And that's a reflection of how much stigma uh, and how much lack of access autistic people have to deal with. Uh, let me see, Ian Lasky, along the lines of access is love, what best practices have you seen or have ideas about? Well, I can do better than that. Um, I asked a bunch of autistic people, uh, people I know online, to suggest best practices in the workplace. Um, and I know we're running out of time. Uh, these are all so good, I wish I could read them all. 
uh, but I'll just read a few because they're, they're very helpful and very generative ideas. Um, no enforced, so this is in the workplace. No enforced socializing, optional socializing that is inclusive. Two, a standard interview process is basically a list of things that many autistic people find stressful or struggle to do well. Look the interviewer in the eye, strong handshake, sell yourself, be a real team, pl team player. Rethink interview and onboarding processes to get beyond hiring people like us. Firms like Specialistern and the German software giant SAP have pioneered methods of interviewing and onboarding that play to the natural strengths of neurodivergent people, like allowing potential hires to put the quality of their work front and center rather than their charming personalities. Um, offer a choice of where to sit in an office when possible. Provide for individualized control of sound and light levels. Allow employees to use noise canceling headphones, earbuds, or white noise machines as appropriate, and to work in rooms with no fluorescent lights because some neurodivergent people can detect the flicker that is subliminal for neurotypicals and it's uncomfortable. Offer natural light when possible, supplemented by dimmable lighting and desk lamps. I could go on and on, but I, I know that your time is all uh, pressed. So uh, I guess we should start winding up pretty soon. Um, but uh, I can send, Bo Bonnie, I can send you that list of workplace accommodations. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. Um, let's see. I think that's the, all of the I think that's it, yeah. In, okay, in chat. If anyone has a, a, a last one real quick, otherwise I'll, I'll share one of them. I, Before you share that, I'll let you close this out partly. I just wanted to say one thing. By way of obviously, thank you, Steve, for the, the time and I'll let Bartley take us home. But one thing we do at Keystone is we tell stories and we tell stories about very complicated topics, um, a lot of technology topics, a lot of um, math, a lot of in, insanely big data. I thought that the last hour was a bit of a masterclass in storytelling and narrative around really complicated medical topics where wow. Steve gave us the illusion that we understood what was actually happening. <laughs> but there was, I mean, there's so many humans at the center of every story that Steve told and it's, Steve does it very naturally, but there's another thing that we learned today, which is just, you know, they, I think one of the great, he's one of the great talkers and it was a, just an absolute pleasure to, to listen to you, Steve, and, and also just to learn. Um, it's, it was really something. So partly I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Oh, thank you, Jeff, and 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 what a great uh, overview of 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 the hour. Uh, no, Steve, I just wanted to to thank you and and to um, highlight to, for those that that haven't read the book yet. There's 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 a ton more great nuggets. I, I appreciated items of uh, the treatment of of human operating systems or or the idea of of can't waste a brain, um, and all the diverse ways to 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 think, uh, and 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 explore the the human condition we share. Um, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you for being here and for hosting me and uh, keep up the great work. And it's been really a pleasure to spend this morning, morning for me in San Francisco with you guys.